Hello, I'm Mike Ryan and welcome to BNAP Today, Thursday, September 24, 2020. The global community has watched in disbelief as the Australian state of Victoria, led by Premier Daniel Andrews, implemented the most draconian measures by a Western government. It's been bungle after bungle after bungle. It's been lie after lie after lie. The most deaths from COVID-19 in Victoria sentenced Victoria to economic misery and are trying to put in place new laws that even Stalin would be proud of. Victorian Treasury economist Sanjeev Sablok posted comments condemning the Andrews government and was ordered to remove them. Instead, he resigned. First of all, Sanjeev, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike, for having me. Um, it, it's, um, I think, something I'm grateful for you to have uh, to take this message out to the people. I think it's time to wake up. You've taken this radical step in resigning. So what prompted you to go public in the, in the way that you did? Because it wasn't uh, behind the scenes. It was really out, out in front, wasn't it? Absolutely. I came out, fr in, you know, on the front foot and fighting because uh, I had already formed a very dim view of the, the government's approach to this pandemic uh, over the past six months, right from the day one, to be precise. Um, I had been communicating to my seniors within the uh, government, uh, you know, that the, the data are very clear. They're telling us it's, uh, it's distributed in a particular way, the age-based distribution of risk, the comorbidity, and so on. And what we saw at the end of the day, I think I was reading somewhere that uh, less than 2% of the people who died in Victoria or in Australia, I think it was, uh, have been less than the age of 60. So when you can see such a sharp demarcation of the data in terms of the risk distribution, it is the most alt alt basic common sense to really, really, really protect the elderly. And I think that was the message I passed out to my seniors uh, uh, in writing, and I've got records of that. Um, uh, in mid, in, I think it's the 20th or 25th of February, as soon as the studies came out uh, from China on this information. I was, I was told within the government um, I'm, that this is a matter for the DHHS, which is the health department. Now, in a normal course of events, uh, I would expect that uh, the Department of Treasury and Finance, we, we are not just paid there to sit and listen to what departments do or tell us. We paid significant money by the government to advise on the comprehensive nature of the policy implications of a particular proposal. So if somebody comes to me uh, and says that I'm going to shut down all the roads because, hey, guys, that's going to shut down all the, all, you know, stop all that, all the fatalities, road fatalities. You can bet that I'm going to start, you know, asking a lot of questions about the total impacts. Now, this was pretty similar in that sense. A lockdown of the entire society was pretty much similar to shutting down all the roads. In fact, people basically didn't get out of the roads as well. And so road fatalities did come down, by the way, as well. But the point is that there are significant implications of such policies. And so there is a cost benefit test. I understand that they, they hired some, you know, uh, maybe consultants or whatever from the Melbourne Uni or whatever, and uh, they were doing this modeling, epidemiological modeling. And I can only say that in never in my life have I seen any policy based purely on models. Policy making involves the analysis of all, the, the model is an input to the complete picture. The, the model is not telling us <clears throat> how many people are going to die of uh, suicides, how many people are going to not, you know, uh, get, this, get themselves tested for cancer, and so on. So the the entire picture has to be coughed up by those people who are proposing a particular policy, in this case, a line department like DHHS. But I suspect because the, you know, of the emergency situation that was declared, uh, uh, maybe some senior people in DTF thought it's not our business anymore. And that is a fatal mistake. And I'm going to write a lot about that in the future. I'm, I'm writing a longish article uh, questioning the way uh, our uh, public service has performed in this particular case, more like a group think and saying agreeing to whatever a particular department has proposed rather than putting out the entire picture. And in this case, as I've argued in the Finn Review article, it was even more necessary because in a crisis situation, there's not much time to consult. So you should actually put out all your draft papers and draft thinking publicly so that anybody who knows anything about this issue and they could be people who have, whom you don't know, but they actually are quite competent. And they will tell you where you're wrong. But we never did that. We were operating like a star chamber, a kind mm. of you know hidden uh, place where all the data was hidden and nobody could figure out what's going on. But we, we saw the decisions being taken. And the decisions started with heavy, the, picking up the most heavy-handed approach and went on to the most more and more heavy-handed approaches, like the curfews and so on. Mm. Now, 
in each of these cases, as I've argued elsewhere, the, the fundamental rule of regulation making, and I was in the regulatory policy area in the, in the department, we insist on applying uh, on the government undertaking uh, the least intrusive, the least burdensome, risk-based approach that will just assist the, uh, the community to fix the problem without intervening unnecessarily. Now, the light-handed approach is basically. So what we saw here was the complete reversal, reversal or the abandonment of the good policy-making processes that do exist in, in the government's own guidance on, on how policy is made. I suspect that is due to the fact that this was the emergencies. But this is a, to cut this whole story short, by the time I, I had started writing these articles, I was putting out my views publicly, and then they started a bit of a excessive stuff, where like wearing masks in the open air, and I questioned the evidence, and I started getting critical of the chief health officer. I started getting critical of the Victoria Police once they started beating up people, uh, girls being choked uh, for uh, what? For not wearing a mask in the public, in the open air, where they're not transmitting anything to anybody. I began to see that this was deteriorating rapidly, and I started uh, my my tone maybe have got a bit uh, rough. And I was, uh, you know, suffering serious angst at the whole situation that I came all the way to Australia. I advocate this as a great country with all the best policies in the world and the best policy frameworks. And here we are uh, at, at a point where we're beating up our little girls, our little women, our women. Mm. We're actually stealing. The police go and take out their mobile phone. Another one was, uh, was uh, you know, the shocking one was the, the police uh, boot on the, somebody's head. Look, I got really angry and then uh, uh, might have said a couple of rough words and the department senior officials and the head of the you know people and culture, they convened a meeting with me on the 9th of September and said, Guy, you know, they didn't identify any particular post, but they said, hey, uh, you should go and review and remove all the direct and indirect criticism of the government. Now, the direct criticism was probably almost insignificant, uh, but the indirect could be thousands. You know, I'm criticizing the lockdown policy for six months. Mm. I've got all the research behind me to say this is unscientific. This is not going to kill the virus. This doesn't solve the problem. You need to flatten the curve in a sensible manner, which you're not doing because ICUs in Victoria are completely empty. And we have not really dealt with the situation as we would do in any other case. What we've done is we've been having a unilateral focus on one item which is the coronavirus. So at that, that point, I, I decided within minutes of that meeting, uh, you know, when my bosses said, hey, you need to uh, do this, uh, you know, social media cleanup. I, I decided I, I got to go. I got to go and raise the alarm publicly because I'm already raising it publicly in a bit of a softer way. Now I'll do it in a really, really hard way. I'll bring it right up to Dan's doorstep, which is what I've done. I brought it at his doorstep. I'm, I'm challenging Dan Andrews, no longer a public servant of his, a uh, full-fledged citizen of this country, mm. and I'm a citizen of Australia for 15 years, I'm a full-fledged citizen exercising my rights to demand the knowledge and the information on the basis of which this government is making its decisions. Tell me yeah. this, yeah. is this, out of the three, is it, yeah. is this more of a health issue, of an mm. incompetency issue, or just gross stupidity, or is it a grab for power issue? Look, uh, these are the kind of, you know, um, speculations. I really can't say what's in what's going on in the government's mind. All I can say is that maybe there's group think going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really I love my people in the, in Victoria. I always have said the Victorian Treasury was Australia's best Treasury. No, nobody can compare, including, you know, yours from Queensland. I'm sorry to say mm. we've had competition there. And I think we compete with the New South Wales Treasury and the Canberra. And we I believe I have very strong reasons to believe we are we are the best mm. now. With such a high quality of talent sitting inside the department, for us to not to get this kind of a policy environment in Victoria, uh, where you know people like me who are very happy working here have to actually quit and then protest, uh, I think it, it it reflects something wrong within the public service more than anything else. I'm not sure who is grabbing power, but all I can say is there's a the public servants, uh, senior public servants, are not advising the government sensibly. Do you think the uh, recent polls, which basically show Dan sitting um, in the uh, mid to high 60s uh, mm. for handling the crisis uh, so well, which he's not. And it's very obvious if you go out outside of Victoria or outside of Australia. Do you think, though, the media and social media has played a, a great impact on swaying the population's view of this mass hysteria? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I think the media, media is probably uh, partly to blame. I, I think the major major issue here is that that like I was reading in the UK, what they did was the Sage S A G is kind of a you know the shorthand for one of the advisors advisory groups there. 
they actually decided to act to deliberately and consciously scare the people. Mm. That was a conscious decision taken by the government. And, and by the way, Australia probably did similar things. And I, I think the reports will come out one day. Uh, we should get the Royal Commission on this. And the question then is, if the government, so because I do know for sure, and I, I don't watch TV, but I've been told by people, uh, including my wife, and including uh, you know people who have reported me on Twitter, etc., that hey, the people have been deadly, badly scared by the advertisements mm. that are going out on the on on these mediums. So it's not just the media, uh, media as such. It's basically the government pouring in taxpayers' money to scare the people. Mm. All right. Now the net result, based on certain polls that I've read about, uh, not necessarily in Australia, but in many other countries, particularly Europe and America, is that the average per punter there thinks that a hundred times more, actually more than a hundred times more people have died from this virus than the actual numbers. So they're, they're estimating around seven to eight percent. The common man thinks that seven to eight percent of the population has died. All right. Mm. Now, um, how did the population get so scared? This is, I call the great hysteria. Never before in human history was a, any scare as big as this, but it's actually funded by the taxpayer. The taxpayer's dollars have been used, is what I'm arguing, to actually funnel and create the scare and of course you can scare people who are not like me or i mean i'm writing 17 articles i'm reading non-stop books and journal articles on on biology because i've got a science background okay very strong science background so i'm reading all that stuff and i'm i'm, I'm reporting but i don't expect the common man to have the time for mm -hmm. that right so they're just looking at the ads and they're saying oh my god this is so scary and who's paying for the ads well they are themselves paying for the ads so now who's going to break that uh, you know thing the the, the gridlock mm -hmm. that is the media now the media, there are a few people, I think Adam Creighton and many others, uh, you know, Chris Kenny and a few others, Janet Albrechtson, uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, Sky News, many people there. Uh, there have been a number of people in the media who have been questioning this thing. There have been people like uh, Gigi Foster and uh, mm. other economists raising matters in Australia. But I think at the uh, overall, I, I suspect here's the problem. Um, you know, the caliber, uh, the, just the intellectual caliber required to actually ask questions is just too high. And I think journalism does not hire that kind of caliber, okay? That kind of caliber is generally found in business or it's found in the public sector. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the media, when, when it starts hiring leftovers, basically, of the intellectual uh, field, you, these guys have no capacity to ask the question, to even do a simple calculation like the one I showed you. Hey, how many people would have died today if it was Spanish flu? 210 million. I have actually not seen that. I wrote to the Australian as a comment. They actually had published a chart saying 50 million died. They put a little diagram and they put a little box. Uh, I mean, they put a little image of a virus and they, they, they sized the different pandemics and they showed it as 50 million. Well, the other and the Asian flu or whatever with the numbers that were there at the time. But sorry, you've got to scale up to today, please. For God's sake, do not mislead everybody by putting 50 million at the time when one was when the world population is 1.8 mm. billion, today is 7.5 billion. Please scale up, for God's sake, you don't have that basic ability. The Australian does not have the journalists who can calculate basic things. Mm. So when you're looking at the quality of journalism being so pathetic, then you look at the questions these guys ask uh, the, their ministers. I think that, you know, when we talk of the 8R or whatever scores, journalism requires some of the smartest people in the world. Actually, to uh, for a society to survive, we need very, very smart judges. Mm -hmm. So the, the lawyers must be the very, very topmost in the, in the society because that sets up the framework for everything. I mean, if, if our lawyers and judges are poor quality, we're sunk as a society. It doesn't matter whatever else happens. Then you want very high quality economists. And then you want... Uh, very, very high quality journalists. Now, these people will actually look at the broader picture and keep the society in control. But journalism, I think, has failed because they just don't have the caliber. So it's, I'm sorry about that, journalists. Most of you just don't understand basic arithmetic. Mm. But, 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 the, but, but the problem here is you paid this highly, very competent public sector. I mean, this, these public servants, you know, I'm just one example. Like, there are there are 100, and 100 plus economists in the treasury, altogether 800 people, uh, 800 of us, 800, including people, you know, with finance and super backgrounds, okay? Extraordinary people, each of them an extraordinary brilliant person in his, in his own right, or his or her own right. And what are these people doing? What, what did they do to advise the government? I don't expect the minister to have the caliber of what the public servant is. The public servants are paid very well, and they're paid, and they're given a permanent job, they sort of, you know, a quiet job they can just do the analysis and advice mm. okay that's that's a simple job just do it and mm. so it's I, I don't blame that much the, the ministers I don't blame that much the journalists I actually blame the public service which has got which has been paid by the taxpayer uh, billions of dollars in in tax uh, you know salaries mm. to advise 
the government in the best possible manner. And I was proud to be part of this government, which actually was doing its job very well. Sanjeev, yeah. you, you're very passionate, but what about uh, support, uh, uh, private support from uh, many officials? Has there been much and uh, is there a, a widespread unease in the bureaucracy about how these policies and decision making are being handled by the Andrews government? Uh, very good point, Mike. And here is the problem uh, we faced uh, uh, with the working from home environment. So we were uh, basically, I've been working from home from end of February and uh, many, uh, most others in the department from mid-March. And uh, we've not met each other. You know, what happens in an organization like us, we are a collegiate organization, okay? We would be best represented as a little college, a college of uh, economists. Uh, you know, the entire, we're basically talking to each other, bumping into each other, chatting around and, you know, talking to the bosses, everybody equal. You can be a fresh economist, you can be the senior most person, they're all equal, chit-chatting, chit-chatting all the time. Okay, so uh, that completely collapsed in the work from home situation so then what happened is we managed uh, there was a group of people and i won't name uh, cannot name and she will not she will never name but there's a small group of people which were interacting okay and that was expressing significant concern and the concerns were getting more and more raised and escalated and i think one or two even said oh my god i've got to leave this uh, leave melbourne this is getting crazy as soon as it's open i've got to get out of this place uh, because they will get a job anywhere else in the world you know economists who are working in the treasury are competent enough to get a job anywhere in the world that's the kind of level right so they can just escape and get out and i think many will uh, but they should not i've been asking them please hang on uh, hold on we will we will sort it out let's let's see this is not the end of the world we will get victoria back on track and for that what you, what we need is the good people to not leave us okay so that's the first thing we don't want a good economist to leave and the good people to leave but we do want uh, the government to start thinking again and i think the concern that you know people have i, I won't i can't generalize which is very significant or widespread but i would imagine that anybody who's committed to good policy and there are all of us who are committed to good policy would have deep down very, very severe concerns about the way this has been done. Mm. If somebody wants to uh, add to the cause, how do they contact you? I'm available freely on the you know internet. My email, uh, sublock at gmail.com. It's available widely. My Twitter, I've got a very, pretty large public profile for the last 15 years. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm available any, uh, to anybody. Yeah. Well, it's that time of the week again, the moment that we all look forward to from the OLA of Vegas, Kirk Lake. Kirk? That's right. That's right. The outdoor living area is what we've got here. It's kind of a cool day now that fall is underway here in the Northern Hemisphere. It's only about 40 today. So a bit chilly, <laughs> almost almost too cool for the pool at 40 degrees. Oh, my gosh, Mike. It's just almost scary. It's not almost. It is scary what is going on. The most challenging, the most dangerous time for America, certainly for my lifetime. And, of course, who needed the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What an American tragedy. What a life, though, she led. Absolutely amazing. Will be the first woman to lie in state at the Capitol. So that, of course, means a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And let me read a quote from our very special guest that we've got here. This is from a 2016. This is the direct quote. The American people should have a voice in the selection of their next Supreme Court justice. Therefore, this vacancy should not be filled until we have a new president. Now, that, of course, from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And what I've got here for you, Mike, this is very exciting. I have the true essence of Senator McConnell. And I think, oh, my gosh, he's looking even better than normal. This is his true soul of Senator McConnell. I don't know if you can see him here. Let's bring him on. This is the majority leader of the U.S. Senate. It's Mitch McConnell. Say say hi, everybody. Say I, hi, could, I truly, I thought... Uh, hi, Mitch. I, I thought that... Hi, great no, I thought, I thought that you maybe... See him, Mitch? No, no. That's his spirit. No, That's I thought it... Soul, no, right no, no, Kirk, Kirk. I, it looks know. like... It's Mitch McConnell. No, it looks like your Mitch possible McConnell. future president, Pelosi. <laughs> Well, you know, she is third in line to the presidency, and I think she looks better than certainly Mitch McConnell there. Some people could argue that was Lindsey Graham. I think they kind of have the same essence that we've got going on there. And, of course, Trump trying to say it's political hackery, what 
uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg told her granddaughter just uh, days before her death, my most fervent wish is that I not be replaced until a new president is installed. Clearly, that's not going to happen. We thought maybe we had the Senator Murkowski from Alaska, even Senator Collins, who always is so distressed. She's in a vicious race for a Senate seat in Maine. They came out and they said they'd say no, no until after the election. But it's 53 votes they have in the Senate, so they really need to lose two more Mm. because a tie goes to the vice president. We thought Mitt Romney may come in there and do the decent thing. After all, this is a man who voted to convict Trump during the impeachment. So the man, according to him, he voted to impeach him. Trump is a criminal, according to Mitt Romney. But of course, if it suits his political needs, oh, go ahead and support uh, appointing a Supreme Court justice who right now it looks like it's going to be this Amy Barrett woman who I've, who I've you know, we still don't know for sure. But I've, um, I've printed out some stuff on her. She basically feels that we don't have the separation of church and state in the United States. We have a separation of the state from the church to let them basically do whatever they want. Mm. She sounds like someone that'd be completely cool with a theocracy here in the United States. So against LGBT rights, against uh, uh, pro-choice rights. So this is going to put a 6-3 conservative majority on the court. And you may ask, Mike, what can the Democrats do about it? What can the Democrats do about it? Well, right now, not a whole lot, unfortunately. Oh, but that's sad. But there's a big but here. It's but big letters B U T B but that we've got going on there. Should and right now, I was just taking minutes ago a look at a new article in the Economist, which gives the Democrats a two-thirds chance of taking control of the Senate. If they do, I think it's a foregone conclusion that the filibuster is out of here. That means all legislation can get approved with a majority vote, as has been the case now with judicial appointments. But what they can also do if the Democrats hold the House, which is virtually a certainty, Joe Biden wins. But of course, we just had minutes ago before we're recording this, we had Trump saying, oh, the ballots, you know, they're a mess. There is no way the Atlantic. I was just reading an article today from the Atlantic saying one certainty of this election is there's no way that Trump is going to concede. And I was just taking a look at Quiniac <laughs> poll that just came out today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what's fascinating with this poll is of Trump supporters, 57 percent, 47 percent of the people still say they're going to vote on election day. And of that 47 percent, are Trump supporters, 35% are Biden supporters. So it is conceivable Trump could have the lead on the night of November 3rd. But is that going to change? You bet it is. Is Trump going to accept that change? You know he won't. Because looking at the other numbers here, vote at early voting locations, which is what I'm going to do. They open for early voting here in Nevada on Saturday the 17th. I'll be there to vote that first day early voting 15 percent of the electorate and that is going to be 65 percent for biden 34 percent for trump and here's what's really key the vote by mail and trump is making all these specious arguments that foreign governments could flood the mail with fake ballots really but the problem is many people believe that and so folks that vote early by mail or absentee ballot we have 34%, so basically a third of the electorate, 68%, 68% for Biden versus only 26% for Trump. And some other fascinating results from this Quiniac Quiniac poll, which I find uh, very interesting often, is a favorability rating as far as approval or uh, lack of approval, favorable versus unfavorable. Biden, it's 45 to 45, 45% approve of him. 45% find him unfavorable. However, Donald Trump, 41% approve favorable, 55% unfavorable for a minus 14. And overall, his handling of the job as president approved 43, disapproved 53. So basically, Mike, what you've got is you have all this cataclysm that we've had during the entire year. You've had a year like no other here in the United States and yet have the poll numbers moved? Not much. It's all gonna be down to the Senate. 
And this is an extremely long way to get back to the answer of what can the Democrats do? First, taking control of the Senate is absolutely mandatory. So if the they've got really three choices, they can live with it, which I, it's going to be tough to do. But if you have the House, which they will, Nancy Pelosi, third in line, if this is not resolved, the election on January 20th at noon in the Constitution, that's when Trump terms end. If the new president has not been established, Nancy Pelosi does become the temporary president. So the Democrats have to have It's very scary, win. though, isn't it? Very scary. Well, it would only be a t- temporary situation there. Mm. And uh, Like Joe Biden, he's tempor- he, he'll be temporary, too. Well, well, he's probably just one term, but you well, never Probably know. one month. No, no, but Kamala, Kamala Harris. Kamala. Kamala. Kamala Harris. Kamala, it's with like a comma. Kamala Harris, fine with me fine mm. with me she's an amazing woman and but what could happen here okay basically they could try to work around it through legislative means if you've got control of the house the senate and the white house or third and i'm fascinated by this i am extremely intrigued by this because about uh, 85 years ago in the late 1930s franklin roosevelt wanted to expand the supreme court because they kept knocking down a lot of his uh, new a uh, new deal proposals rather and by expanding the court they could get through back in those days things like the nra had a totally different meaning that was the national recovery administration and they got a lot of things done we still have a lot of public works buildings that were uh, constructed mm. and built during that depression era so the talk is that the Supreme Court could be expanded from the nine justices. Nowhere in the Constitution does it state where the Supreme Court, the number of justices, and it has been augmented a number of times throughout our history. So there's talk that it should be augmented at least to 11, perhaps even to 13. And I think there's no reason that shouldn't happen, especially when you have people like our special guest, Mitch McConnell here, and uh, Lindsey Graham, who said, no way. Mm. No way. No, Pelosi had nothing. No, she no does same, same, same hairstyle. Lipstick no. looks exactly the same. No way. <laughs> no way would they consider a Supreme Court justice so close to the election. But here they are mm. doing it. So what's fascinating is here we've got people that are really hurting. The food bank lines, as we've talked about, really long. Many people having problems with their unemployment here in Las mm. Vegas some of the highest unemployment, if not the highest unemployment in the country, and yet they do nothing about another stimulus bill to help us here out in places like Las Vegas. And yet, when it comes to appeasing the evangelicals, the Trump base, Mm -hmm. then they just rush, can go rush and put this nomination through. It's going to be fascinating to see the repercussions of how this all plays out. It is going to be I mean, it's, it's going to be tough to sleep. All I can tell you, Mike, is that I am glad I live in a state like Nevada where just to ease my stress, I was able to get my um, and we have recreational marijuana legal here in Nevada, but I was able to get my medical marijuana card approved so I can get much higher doses and lower <laughs> prices and be able to make it through. Just just in wrapping this up, I mean, uh, over the, f- the last few weeks, um, the uh, level of stress has been rising. Um, do, no, you, do, you, do you have that? Do you have that in the corner? That dark, scary monster. Do you feel that getting bigger? That you think Donald might win? I, I don't think he's going to win. I think there's no way in the world that he's going to get a majority of the votes. Does that mean he's going to leave power? That is a totally Mm. different question. We're in a cold civil war right now in the United States. I think there's very limited doubt about that. Will there be a shooting civil war? I think there are going to be deaths. Mm. I think between the election and the inauguration, people will die. There will be political deaths in the United States. Will that be enough to cause a civil war? Who knows? Mm. Will there be just one or two or three? Let's hope. Or maybe zero. Maybe Mm. I'm completely wrong. It's just all hyperbole that I'm spouting out. But let me tell you, we're not taking any chances. I cannot believe trail mix. You didn't know what trail mix was. It's American thing where you have like dried fruit. We must have 20 pounds of trail mix. We have gallons and gallons of water. We have all kinds of semi non-perishable food like raisins and prunes, dried cherries. 
I'm it's very, goal. I'm very impressed though, because not only will you, you know, possibly supply, you know, survive the Armageddon of yes. the uh, the uh, the fanatics either side, you'll actually have yes. regularity. I mean, because there's plenty of fibre in that, and that's, <laughs> a that's lot good. of fibre in the fruit. <laughs> that's, that's good exactly to hear. Right. Now, but you, what I'm trying to do <laughs> is prepare for 30 days with no food, or no power, no water know anything because just basically i think we're as safe as any place in an urban neighborhood but, here but who would have guessed even a year ago even two it, years ago with democrats could control of congress who would have ever guessed that such thinking would need to take place in the united states maybe in belarus maybe in the ukraine hmm. maybe in kazakhstan or in south australia because they have no power they haven't got much at all. I mean, they, they, they rely on batteries from Elon Musk and windmills. Uh, I can't comment and, on and, that. And then what happens is when the, when the battery runs out after 30 minutes and the, uh, there's no wind, they actually have to borrow it from other states who have stuff called um, coal. So anyway, that's well, another. You, you know what? It's been a long time since I've been on a station in South Australia. I think that was 5SE. Yes. Back, way back when with you. Oh, that's with right. You. That's right. What, what was that in the, in the early 1950s? 18, that 1850s. That was when we used to pedal the bike for power. Now, one more thing. One more thing. Sure, scenario sure. here. Scenario. OK. Yeah. Um, there's a minor civil war. You have people that have that have AKGs. They have handguns. Security firms yes. are ramping that up. And yes. then Kirk has his bug spray. I mean, I do you do. think do you think though maybe just to think that maybe you should get something a little more powerful than you know, than you know, fly I spray? I certainly thought of that, but to be <laughs> even competent armaments, mm. it's thousands of dollars, and the armaments make me nervous. When I was a young man in the mm. '80s, I bought a 357 Magnum because it was the thing to do when mm. you're working in North Florida, and you were there. You came to Panama mm. City. That's right. How could I forget? Way. Oh my God! Pineapple Willies. So <laughs> I think they're still in business, amazingly. Another and story. La Vila and scooters. <laughs> scooters are still on. there. Scooters. scooters are still there. Absolutely. But anyway, so the thing was, and I can understand the power. I mean, it's easy when you get that in your hand and you feel that power. It's easy to understand the appeal, but the danger, especially with someone, and if you've been watching, if you've watched this whole thing, you know, I'm often not the calmest person out there no. so i just felt the danger of having it mm. was not worth the value of having it so since that time i have never owned a firearm and this bug spray can shoot 30 feet and i won't kill anybody hopefully we'll keep them from attacking <laughs> but won't kill anybody and hopefully we won't have to use it we can just use it on a wasp nest next year after joe biden is uh, president of the united states mm. now uh, we must wrap it up. We must say goodbye. Uh, but we need to say goodbye to Nancy, too. It's Mitch. It's Mitch and Nancy. No, it looks like Lindsay Nancy. Graham. No, it's the Lindsay same. Graham. No, no, Lindsay. it's her hair. Mitch it's her hi. lipstick. I can see it. Hi. It's the look hi, in the, It's the look in the eyes. Clown. Kurt. He's a clown. <laughs> no, no, it's no, no, on, no here, Nancy. Look at the lipstick. Here, here, look at the eyes. Look at the stare. Come on up. Come on up. Come on. Kirk Clyde. Oh, she uh, went to the groomers. Kirk Clyde so and Nancy last? or Mitch, thank you very much. And she went to the groomers since we were here last. Look. And after Kirk, that's it for BNAP today and possibly the world as we know it, September 24, 2020. I'm Mike Ryan.